Hello everyone and welcome to my channel Needed Art History where I'm sitting telling you some art history stories while knitting and uh, well hello I missed a few weeks because <laughs> uh, I had a lot of stuff to do and just overall was not in the mood to talk uh, but uh, today I'm coming back with a video about another museum another well British Museum. So the next time I will search something up, something from other countries, but I just, you know, I, I remember because I already have one video about uh, the um, Wallace collection, so if you're interested, check it out. And uh, back then when I was like preparing this, I found out about the today's topic the Leighton House Museum and I was very interested because it's like an amazing house, amazing building and I was like no, I really wanted to share it also with you and uh, to learn about this uh, myself. So yeah, so today we're going to be talking about this. And before we'll start, so check out the description box. So I will leave you some of the videos also here on YouTube. One of them is like this virtual excursion through the house. So there's like a lot of interesting fun facts there. Uh, I, I unfortunately found this video after I already made uh, like prepared my material for today. But at least, you know, I watched it and I checked some of the uh, some of the points and well uh, some of the information. Also, I will obviously leave down the link uh, below to the official site of the museum, so you can also like check whatever you want. You know, check their collection or anything. And uh, yeah, so without further ado, I'm taking my knitting today. I'm going to be knitting <laughs> finally, and let's dive into our, our topic today. So as you are seeing by the name of the video, today we're going to be talking about Leighton House Museum. So it's like another uh, house collection, not a very massive big museum, but um, you know, a very beautiful one. It was built for a British artist, Frederick Leighton. So uh, also I will not get into his art and I will not get into Frederick Leighton as artist. Today we're going to be talking purely about the building, about his house, because well I mean maybe one day I will make, but to be honest I, I like search his works, I looked them and they didn't really spoke to me to be honest, so I was not really impressed about these works. And, uh, you know, I don't like to talk about stuff that I don't like personally, so, uh, yeah, because I'm very bad at hiding my emotions uh, and my, like, expressions and everything, so I think it will be very boring and because I will be not interested in that. So, yeah, so, so I will not touch his... Uh, his development as an artist obviously will be like mentioning some of his works or something because well this is his collection uh, but overall it's about the building today the architect of the building was uh, George Aitchens um, he's like friends of uh, Frederick Layton and as it should be the house was both a private residence uh, 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 of the artist and his studio so after the death of uh, Layton it became a museum overall Layton family was quite wealthy so uh, Technically, they started as upper middle class, but Leighton's uh, grandfather, yeah, grandfather, he was actually a doctor of uh, a uh, Russian Tsar, Russian emperor, uh, but Russian emperor who, like Alexander, not the last one, and this uh, helped uh, to grow some family wealth and and they actually made like the grand grandpa was able actually to accumulate a lot of fortune a lot of wealth to the point that all of this money they they were uh supporting Leighton uh like Leighton junior 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 I'm talking about Frederick uh till the rest of his life and till the point that already late like Frederick's father was able to quit his job and they were able to move through the Europe because Leighton's mother uh, had a pretty for health and for the health reasons they moved from Britain to they moved to France first then they got to Italy and eventually they settled down in Germany in Frankfurt uh, so this you see like Leighton was traveling starting from very young age and because they already had this fortune this wealth they, they were able to do that without you know being uh, without worrying about uh, finding some jobs. And this is actually the reason why Leighton was able to start uh, his like artist career so successfully. And uh, one of the paintings, so I think it was Madonna Cimabu, if I'm not mistaken, and actually Queen Victoria saw this painting and she like liked this painting so much that she immediately said that she's buying that. And this is 
obviously there was an amazing advertisement so after that after queen victoria bought uh this work uh she you know his fame just got out of the roof and obviously at this point he he didn't uh need money already but at this point he was even more uh, like wealthy than he was before and this also helped Leighton to become a leading artist of Victorian era which uh, well again for me it's like a little bit of an understanding like for example if we compare him to Alma Tadema I have uh... my god Tad Tad Tadema no Tadema <laughs> because uh, I have a video about uh, about him if you are interested and I butchered the stress through the whole hour video uh, but yeah but comparing these two artists for example like I am I prefer Alma a little bit more than uh, Frederick Leighton but well uh he was also so successful that in 1878 i mean frederick um, became the president of royal academy of arts and then in 1896 that was um he died this year actually uh, he was uh, given the title of lord actually and it is believed uh, uh, like it was written that uh, frederick uh, uh, layton was actually the first and only uh, british artist to ever receive this title and uh, also i think i read somewhere that he actually got this title and he died the next day so <laughs> it was like <laughs> no not not um uh, not for a long period not for a very long period of time he was a lord but getting back to the house to the building to the museum so Leighton house is part of a small so-called uh like art settlement as we can say that was located near holland park and uh, during 30 years of construction a community called uh, holland park circle uh, was formed there it was called like this because uh, a lot of uh, painters of uh, Victorian era they were uh, like also living uh, in the neighboring houses and all of this was because of uh, Leighton because when he finally finished his house uh, and you know showed this to the public uh, like all of the artists were like blown away and they also wanted stuff like that and they started to move there and by the end of 19th century well at least nine uh, artists very famous artists they also like commissioned uh commissioned this to make houses like this with built-in studios and everything and so for a fact we know that um, one of the neighbors of uh Leighton was uh, were such painters as Whistler as Millet as Delacroix as uh, Rossetti Corot and etc etc so in uh, 1860s uh, being already uh, a very recognized uh, titled well of uh, person uh, by this point he was already making like 4k uh, pounds per, per year so you can imagine this is like enormous sum of money especially for an artist so he was very well well off person so he's buying a plot of land in this um, holland park uh, area and he asked his friend uh, George uh, Aitchinson so they were good friends uh, to build a house for him it was a kind of a good deal we can say for, for both of them for Aitchinson especially because Aitchinson he was actually uh, more of industrial architect he was building a wall like welfare some uh, railway stations and etc so that was his uh, first ever uh, residential project that was his ever house for for a living and uh, he made an amazing job because after that uh, he became actually a very popular as an architect of a um living living residences and uh, he had a lot of commissions after that after Leighton's house and overall they knew each other for quite a while already because they met uh, when like um, Leighton was traveling around Europe uh, he got to Rome in 1850s and this is how they met it's already more than a decade they knew each other and overall from outside uh, we can say that it's a very uh, like simple house very modest uh, just some red bricks so spare decoration inside everything was also modest at first uh, but later demanded extensions and the building started throughout the years gradually uh, growing uh, and uh, it was built like 
all of these extensions was made in several stages and the the price of all of this obviously was immaculate <laughs> because well now like all of the figures are uh, you know approximate because we don't have a uh, direct um, document where we can see how exactly much money was spent on all of this but the museum itself the later museum on their site for example uh, in the in the history where they're telling it they are saying that um the house might have costed him uh, like the first uh, plan the first project the f this this first uh, uh, yeah the fir the first plan uh, costed him uh, starting like from four and a half thousand pounds but obviously when the extensions was made this the price started to grow and for example uh, they in the museum also think that uh, the Arab hall itself might have costed uh, later that seven thousand uh, pounds so it's an immaculate uh, sum of money actually and we'll be talking about this uh, about Arab hall I will show you what is that but you, and I think you will understand that it really might have costed like this uh, but again the the sums all of this the figures are very approximate it's just you know some suggestion that maybe it was like that considering you know the prices of like back then uh, of the time and everything uh, because again I will repeat myself that uh, we don't have records like exact records how much was spent on that the construction of the building uh, started in uh, 1865 while all of this construction was going on Leighton was actually uh, physically he was in Spain he was traveling again so he was in Spain for a few weeks he was then in Rome uh, and when um, like upon his return he was able to move in uh, like in a house. The original plan, as I said, uh, was very <laughs> modest <laughs> compared to, you know, uh, the next years and the next um, extensions. Uh, so uh, it was just a dining room, a drawing room, a breakfast room. There was a hall on the first uh, floor, obviously. Uh, of course, um, Leighton Studio and he and also a very modest uh, Leighton's bedroom as far as i understand there was just one bedroom leighton's bedroom because he was uh, he was not married till the end of his life or he didn't have any children he like his sisters uh, as far as also understood didn't live with him so the house just had one uh one uh, bedroom for him and everything else was made for you know for some parties some like uh, dinners uh, musical concerts and etc etc so the main dominant of the house was obviously his studio and at this point also when our, uh, all of this construction started and uh, uh, there were not a lot of decoration in the house uh, the southern facade was made in this form of a italian palazzo and the northern facade uh, had the large panoramic window that uh, uh, that was in the studio and uh, it was uh, well again it was you know the dominant part of the northern facade three years after the completion of construction Leighton commissioned the first extension so the first extension was not uh, like so super massive or super, super big they just um, um, demolished the eastern wall of the building and thus the building was um, enlarged by five meters and these five meters were given to um, to his studio in addition the house was equipped with a storage uh, room for canvases which could be reached through a hatch in the studio floor and an additional uh, black passage for models which uh, led directly from the street to the studio entering the house obviously the first thing that we are seeing is the hall it's called the staircase hall so it is this um, amazingly beautiful staircase uh, back then and i think even now it didn't change a lot so this uh, staircase was always a place to impress visitors and display large paintings the 17th century Iznik tiles were installed in 1867 and uh, museum also in uh, 2021 they added a stuffed peacock uh, to um, to the staircase and uh, and and this is like not an addition just to a museum we know because there's old photos uh, of Leighton's house that uh, in uh, Leighton's time Frederick time uh, they he, like he also had some uh, he had a soft peacock on the staircase uh, the mosaic floor is here and it's going through the hall and uh, other rooms uh, mosaic floor was designed by architect by Aitchinson so turning left we are getting to the Nars 
Narcissus hole, which uh, connects the staircase holes and Arab hole. Vibrant blue tiles, uh, some of them were produced by a ceramist, uh, William de Morgan, and they were installed as a part of the Arab hole extension. So why um, the ceramist was included also in this and why there is uh, some of this um, ceramics were created in place because obviously uh like i'm getting a bit ahead of myself but i will say it here uh, so it make a little bit more sense so all of these styles they were original from uh eastern countries so like middle east and stuff i will be telling about this right now a lot of tiles so when they arrived in place they were in um they were broken they were in fragments and stuff so uh, they needed to so uh, like Leighton hired some ceramists who created uh, a direct copies of this uh, uh, original tiles i don't know what they were doing with original tiles i think you might have well, I think he preserved them because they were like old tiles of like 15th, 16th, 17th century. Uh, but I am not sure, to be honest, I haven't met any information about that. Uh, but yeah, but it was like that. And after we get through all of these holes, we're getting to the next extension. Uh, and this is, um, you know, th this this room, it is believed to be the pearl of Leighton House and like the, the most famous room. Uh, of the Leighton house, I am talking about Arab Hall. So this extension was uh, like the uh, building of this Arab Hall was uh, going on starting from 1877 till 1881. Uh, and uh, well, this is truly an amazing stuff. You could never uh, tell, you know, going just on the street, uh, passing this house, that you would be able to see such thing in the house. The exterior of the building was also supplemented with a Turkish style dome. Uh, that that was crowning the, the whole Arab hole. As I said, so before settling in London, like Leighton um, was traveling a lot. Everything started in Europe and stuff, but he was not so impressed, obviously, by all of this European art uh, and everything. Uh, so he started to move a little bit further to the east, to Northern Africa, and there, there, uh, that's what you know really blew his mind. And it's again nothing very special because this is exactly this period of time when. Um, um, this oriental style started to be very popular so the uh european like western europeans with their like we had in the eastern regions here in ukraine we had something but because they were under the uh rule of uh, austrian uh austrian hungarian empire uh, so obviously we had some a little bit influence but it's just in in you know all like almost near the border of ukraine right now with poland with uh, hungary and everything other uh, every other like uh, part so central eastern and thousand part of ukraine we didn't like had any we didn't have this type of things uh, well, in Kiev a bit, uh, there was some kind of, you know, Japanese, this, uh, like, impressionistic stuff, because impressionists, they were very fond of J Japanese uh, uh, art, and they found a lot of insp inspiration there, and because, like, start at the beginning of 20th century, at least, it was like this, because we had a little bit... Um, of autonomy here in Ukraine and our artists were able to create a lot of interesting stuff and they were able to travel which is the most important they were, they were seeing exactly what was uh, going on in Europe they, they were the part of this European context also a lot of artists were able to make their names in Europe uh, while they were not popular here in Ukraine and they, they were executed here uh, by Soviet uh, government by Russian government and uh, yeah so where i started this oh so yeah so it's not uh, nothing new uh, it was the period of time the end of 19th century like second half of 19th century and the end, uh, beginning of 20th century it was you know this period of time where people were uh very interested in uh oriental style in uh eclectical styles also and uh, in Britain especially, obviously there was a lot of interest in Indian culture, in Indian architecture especially, uh, so, well, again, understandably, because you have these colonies and everything, and, uh, yeah, and so Leighton, he made a uh, travel to eastern countries, to Algeria, to Egypt, to Syria, uh, and etc, etc, uh, to Turkey also, and he was, as I said, very blown away about 
by their art. So he was traveling, he was through all of these countries, and he was buying a lot of different artifacts, like this oriental artifacts. He was sending it back home. This Arab hall was um, then full with all of these different artifacts, like ceramics, like textile, like, uh, you know, everything, everything you can, you can imagine. A lot of these things are now uh, there in collection, but a lot of things are also lost because they were sold, but we'll be talking about that. And... Um, the walls of this Arab hall is decorated with uh, tiles, Damascus tiles, and the uh, biggest part of them are dated uh, by the end of 16th, beginning of 17th century. The, the whole team, not only of architects, but also of ceramists and sculptors worked in this hall. This was um, a very ambitious and very expensive undertaking. The main inspiration for all this was an interior contained in 12th century Sicilian Norman palace uh, that was called La Cisa at Palermo in Sicily. So the mos mosaics in marble uh, were made in London. Uh, and the gold mosaic frieze uh, was brought uh, um, by pieces from Venice. Then uh, this dome and a fountain was added also. Stained glass and shutters with carvings was uh, brought from Egypt. Uh, and in this exquisite space, decorated with marbles and mosaics, decorated with columns and a font fountain, Leighton housed a rich collection of his uh, oriental uh, artifacts that he was bringing in. And uh, this collection of Damascus tiles of the end of the 16th, uh, beginning of 17th century, it's very important, not just within, you know, the Leighton House, but it is one of the most um, important tile collection uh, held in Britain overall. The fountain and the chandelier was uh, created in London. Uh, the original fountain was actually made from white marble, but then, at some reason, to be honest, I haven't found why, it was changed to, this marble was changed on black one, and uh, they also added some goldfish in the fountain. Uh, the chandelier was made, as I said, in London, however, it was made by the designs, uh, uh, it was, um, no, by the uh, sketches maybe, uh, how to call it right, uh, of uh, Eastern, uh, like Middle Eastern uh, chandeliers. So like Leighton was traveling, he saw all of this stuff and he was um, making some, again, sketches or, or something. And he tried to, to uh, he asked for this to be similar to the originally Middle Eastern chandeliers as possible. And firstly, when, when this was made, this chandelier was made, it was made gas powered, but in 1890s, it uh, obviously was converted to electric one. The first floor uh, also houses the library. This library, it was also Leighton's uh, office. Here we can see a very interesting, unusual stuff. So we can see a fireplace directly under the window. So they created some systems so when the... and it is like a working fireplace, it's not decoration or anything, it's a working fireplace and they were able to uh, got these pipes or tubes, or I don't know what to call it right, uh, in the walls and so the smoke was going like not straight, it was going like horizontally into the wall and was going through the ventilation uh, like somewhere in, in the wall there. The drawing room, it's more like this conventional Victorian era, you know, sitting room, however on the walls there were a lot of paintings of his um, uh, uh, like his paintings, paintings of his friends, artists who were like uh, presenting these paintings to them, or Leighton was buying this, these paintings from uh, his friends, so uh, you can see such paintings, uh, paintings of such um, oh, artists as uh, Coho, as Millet, as uh, Constable, and etc. The dining room also is very interesting, so it was like one of the busiest room in the house, as we can say, there was a lot of parties going on, because the table uh, that is there, so as far as I remember, it's an original table, actually, uh, so yeah, it was, be, uh, it was possible to extend this table to the point that 25 people was able to sit there. Here we can see, actually, the on the walls we can see a uh, collection of uh, ceramics, of ceramic plates and everything like that. However, uh, it is, was mentioned uh, by the museum that now it is not the original uh, like ceramics uh, that was in the period of Leighton, because Leighton in his time had uh, like original ceramics, uh, uh, this uh, Middle Eastern ceramics starting from like um, dating to 15th, 16th century. Now it is a modern, um, well, as far as, as I understood, it's not copies, but it is like modern interpretation of this old uh, this pieces, uh, not directly that were in a Latin collection, just overall the um, old um, 
Middle Eastern ceramics, taking in consideration old traditions. Uh, the other stuff that we can see here is the black, uh, black sideboard. It is also was said that it is not an original piece to the house. Uh, however, uh, it is a modern copy of exact same thing that was back in Leighton's time, uh, but it's just like a modern copy by a modern furniture maker, uh, and um, yeah, was it, and it's like not original, not not an old piece. This piece was back then in time. It was decorated. Um, it was uh, designed, not decorated. It was designed by artists himself because obviously he had a lot of people, a lot of friends uh, from. Uh, this art and crafts movement and arts and crafts it's like you know basically uh, like Arnaud Wall so they also have this philosophy that you are uh, you need to do everything so decorate the, your house uh, so an artist is everyone it's a designer it's an artist it's an architect so they were designing uh, wallpapers uh, furniture ceramics like everything so yes so uh, Leighton was also like doing such things sometimes and this um sideboard is believed to be his own design that was then uh realized in his lifetime but i i don't know to be honest also uh was it sold uh, the original piece or what and i don't know this, this thing i don't know next extension was made in 1890 yes 18 no it was made in 1889 Oh my god, my favorite numbers. The last videos I've been messing up so many numbers uh, that it's like literally ridiculous even. So, uh, 1889, 1889, uh, it would be easier like that. Uh, so they, um, he asked to make a winter studio. It was added to the main studio of the artist and it was, you know, um, it was done for a convenience of work because after all, uh, he was very engaged with uh, Royal Academy of Art and they had um, they needed to present their new works every uh, what was that the end of March the beginning of April so you know the exhibition will be held uh, in summer uh, and that that meant that uh, winter was full of work uh, artists worked in winter and obviously you know London in winter not the best place to work, <laughs> considering also that, you know, the light day is very small and so obviously he needed some uh, space to work so and take, you know, every possible like minutes of this, of this daylight. This is why like this winter studio was created. It was, uh, it had, uh, it was completely gla glazed, as we can say, so it, the two walls were made from glass, the roof was also from glass, and uh, all of this structure was um, supported by a pair of a cast iron columns. In 1895, before it was like a few months before uh, artist's death, uh, the, the silk room was finished. So the end chamber and a silk room was added about the Narcissus Hall when the Arab Hall was uh, uh, when the Arab Hall extension was done. This room was created to be a like a little home gallery. Uh, for his uh, for an uh, all the time expanding collection of Leighton, uh, the wall was lined with um, green silk. This is where you know the name comes from, uh, of this room. On the walls, you could see a lot of uh, paintings of a lot of uh, again his contemporaries, uh, so such as um, already mentioned uh, Alma Tadema, Tadema, Alma Tadema. My God, this stress. <laughs> I'm forgetting all the time how, how to correctly pronounce his name. Okay, so uh, him, uh, Mille also some wo works of Watts, of uh, Sargent and etc. Uh, on the left of this silk room, uh, we are getting to one of the most, as we can say, to be honest, strange rooms. Uh, one of the most unattractive, uh, one of the most, not one, the most ordinary looking room in the house, uh, the bedroom of an artist. So as you can see, <laughs> very monastic as we can say <laughs> room basically there's like nothing just a bedroom a table like uh, uh, some side table interestingly also so uh, on some of the resources i could uh, i saw that um the wallpapers are interesting part because it uh, it was the wallpaper that was created by morris and co with the print india however it is like like this uh again it's if I remember correct, the, the museum actually states that the wallpaper, it indeed looks like Morris and Co. Wall, wall, wallpaper, 
but it was actually designed by uh, George Gilbert Scott Jr., son of the great Victorian architect uh, Sir George Gilbert Scott. Yeah. After that, after this room, we are getting to the impressive art studio of a uh, artist. So this original one and extended to a uh, winter one, a winter studio. This is the largest room in the house. Uh, there was a showroom and a functional workspace. Every spring, musical soirées were uh, held uh, in this large studio. Some of the most prominent international musicians of the day performed here for a select group of uh, Leighton's friends. So continuing through, there were also this uh, staircase, as I mentioned, that uh, were made um, uh, directly to models. Uh, the models were entering through um, a separate staircase. And, uh, well, it was said that uh, in Victorian era, you know, the uh, family and work life needed to be separated. And even though, uh, again, there was a house of a person that was not married, later he chose to follow the social etiquette and uh, he, that's why he, he made uh, things like that. Uh, so there were also a fireplace uh, here to warm the models uh, who posed nude sometimes obviously in his studio uh, uh, there were also some kind of um, screen so the models will be able to change themselves and then going through the studio you're going to this winter studio going through the winter studio you then um, reach the top of the new helical staircase to move down to the ground floor and basement. In the basement, so all of these uh, things like kitchen and stuff, all of this were in the basement and well now it does not exist anymore because obviously you know there were a lot of reconstructions and when it became a museum uh, so like you know you need space for archives, for fonts, uh, for just you know just stuff rooms and stuff so all of this were redone into things like this that would be more con convenient to uh, a museum institution now. The house during the lifetime of uh, Frederick Layton was already like a museum and there were like a lot of people during his uh, lifetime going on there and on the walls you could see a lot of different uh, paintings of a lot of different artists, not just the uh, contemporaries of uh, Frederick Layton but also some of the works of old uh, uh, masters. Unfortunately, the most of the of these works, most of the, most of the Leighton's collection was sold after his death. The reason was because of the will of uh, the artist. Uh, so in 1896 uh, he died and according to the will the main uh, part of Leighton's fortune went to his sisters. Uh, but it will get to his, uh, to his sisters in the condition that they should establish a fund uh, that will support students of Royal Academy of Art. And this fund, uh, you know, needed, uh, well, like 10k pounds. And obviously two women in Victorian era, they didn't have such money. So they decided that, well, the only way how they can manage to, you know, have this money uh, is to sell the house. Uh, and sell his collection. However, they were not able, they wanted to sell the house as it is, with collection, everything, but they were not able to do this. Uh, and they decided that, okay, then we will sell some parts of the collection just, and uh, they were able to preserve the house, um, which is like lucky for us now. Um, but yeah, so this is how, how it went. Half of the collection was sold uh, on the auction, uh, on Christie's actually, and the auction was held, uh, was going on for eight days. And as a result, Leighton House was left within a small fraction of the, of once a very rich collection. The house, as I said, on its own was preserved and in 1900 it was opened as a museum. And uh, back then it was run by a committee chaired by Leighton's neighbor and uh, biographer woman Emily Barrington. So at this period of time the focus of the exposition in a museum was uh, drawings of Leighton because they were able to um, preserve uh, 700 pieces of different uh, Leighton's drawings again. Uh, so sisters also helped with that, they like donated or you know, let museum buy it. In 1927 the ownership uh, of the museum passed to the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea and they continued to um, they are continuing actually to manage in this museum till this day. Around the same time, uh, a local family called Perrin donated money for a new uh, exhibition space designed by 
Elsie Ricardo, to be added to the house. The ground floor of this new addition was used uh, variously as a venue for the theater museum, a children's library, and uh, most recently as uh, staff uh, offices. And in 1950s, there were also some extension made to, uh, again to uh, enlarge this children's library, something like that, and uh, also at some exhibition spaces. And well, you know, it was going on, it was still growing. Uh, the house was still growing. In the collection overall, there is a lot of interesting stuff, and they also have the uh, in the collection the work of um, Leighton, such, such work as Death of Brunelleschi of 1852. This is like one of the first, uh, like uh, one of, not first, one of the earliest uh, works of uh, uh, Leighton, and they also have a work uh, Clitia, which was uh, actually. If I'm not mistaken, that was actually his last painting, so the painting that he created like 40 years uh, after, uh, like at the end of the career, so it's a very interesting also, I think and it's a very nice thing to have in a collection of one of the first works and the last one. There uh, were also some sculptures, so Leighton created three sculptures during his lifetime. Uh, it's uh, uh, Leather, Athlete Fighting a Python and Excessive uh, Excitement. So the artist created only these uh, sculptures uh, because his main passion was obviously painting. And as I said, uh, the museum mostly have a very vast collection of uh, Leighton's uh, drawings. Among them also is the uh, sketches for this Madonna Cimabue that was bought by uh, Victoria and that uh, brought uh, the fame to Leighton uh, because uh, the original like Madonna Cimabue is from not mistaken it's uh, well, obviously it's still in the royal collection. They also uh, so uh, the most famous work of Leighton, the Burning June, is not in the collection because it is in uh, Puerto Rican Museum. Uh, however, um, like I, I don't know when, I don't remember when, uh, but uh, at some point, uh, Puerto Rican Museum they brought this uh, um, this uh, piece to Leighton Museum uh, for an exhibition for like certain period of time, and they then obviously got it back. But uh, the museum staff were able to make a quality photo of that uh, so now like technically this burning june is in the museum but it's not an original it's a printed version it's a, so they made a print of this uh, painting and it's now held in the museum also and obviously a part of the paintings there's a lot of personal stuff a lot of uh, you know utility stuff that was uh, uh, used um, by Leighton, a lot of different diplomas, a lot of different awards, and etc. etc. And interestingly, uh, the thing that I found very um, like nice, as we can say, uh, it was that Leighton actually never, uh, you know, preserved this house for himself. So apart, obviously, when he was in the town and he was making all of these parties, all of these concerts, uh, you know, uh, people were coming to his studio, the customers were coming to his studio, uh, he was. Uh, he actually wanted for people to see his collection and what he he was, you know, preserving. And it was not rare, you know, for uh, children to be in the libraries uh, there to uh, again to just uh, some customers to wumble around the house and to, a part of his studio just to overall see all of these beauties, all of these soirees and everything. And when he was um, away from the country, because when he was traveling, he was traveling for like a pretty extensive period of time so it was like at least two three weeks and he was allowing people to actually come and visit his house his uh, um handmaiden you know his uh servants or to call it right uh they were selling tickets basically so he was making money also out of this you know to maintain all of the the house and stuff and and he was so sharing this beauty with uh, people around but after Leighton's death, uh, unfortunately, the house got uh, lost its popularity completely, uh, and uh, yeah, and it was kind of forgotten. Like Leighton, also as a painter, was kind of forgotten after his death. It was just you know last like decades, the the last decades of twentieth century when Leighton began to be. Uh, you know, like British um, art historians and critics and, uh, you know, collectors, maybe whatever, uh, so people of uh, in art industry, they started to get interested in him. And uh, it was just uh, starting from 1970s that Leighton uh, House Museum again uh, began to be pretty popular and started to gain interest from 
other people and was like each year started to attract again visitors and etc a lot of parts of the house now uh, is open also like for example this staircase that were used by models this secret staircase uh to get directly to artist studio and uh, the the artist's bedroom also it's a new thing uh, that is like that was open to the public not so long ago uh so yeah uh, the restoration also, I will end this video with restoration because it was, you know, it got through some stages uh, of restoration. So the one of the most um, massive one it was done in 2008 uh, till 2010. So the um, there's some company, the uh, BDP company. So they were the one who were doing this restoration and they spent uh, 7.8 million pounds on all of this uh, so from 2008 to 2010 through so these two years Leighton House was closed uh, closed for extensive ref refurbishment and restoration to bring it close to the state that it was during uh, Leighton's lifetime many pieces of furniture and textile have been reproduced and original paintings uh, and pieces uh, loaned back uh, for display restoration were also done to Arab room using a real gold uh, to like cover all of this dome and everything uh, so a lot of things were done and renovating this house was obviously a very uh well extremely difficult as after all you see this building is a list um, like it, it's included inside you think it's called great uh, two listed buildings and um, as far as i'm like fun information there's just like six percent of the, all of the buildings in britain that is in this list so buildings in these groups are very difficult to uh difficult and time consuming to restore because uh, the owners are obligated to keep the buildings in its original state uh, that is if something uh, needs to be changed then it should be done authentically uh, as possible obviously and only with the permission of uh, uh, special commission so it's you know it's cool because you are living in a very important historical building you know the building was a very rich history but on the other hand it's such a uh such a bugger i don't know what to call it even right that you know it's a very stressful i think situation it's very stressful uh, living there because <laughs> you can literally not change anything without uh, a permission from uh, from these commissions, from the government, basically, and uh, yeah, so same situation. The other works were also carried out not so long ago. They um, made an additional uh, gallery, and also they created a uh, the Morgan uh, Cafe there. And both the restored wing and the historic house now now have like uh, this uh, step free access and are interconnected thanks to an elevator and a spectacular helical uh, staircase that is decorated with a hand painted oriental mural. So the museum commission. So this mural is called uh, Oninis, and it decorates the whole the staircase. And it is a first uh, at this point a contemporary work made by an Iranian artist, contemporary artist. Shahrazad Ghaffari. It is like this 11 meter high mural that was uh, inspired by a 13th century poem by Rumi exploring cultural unity and uh, it made it this uh, turquoise blue color so it was you know so it would correlate with this Arab hole in the in a building and uh, currently so it was closed for some period of time but currently it is opened uh, they finally opened the museum again in, on 15th of October I believe uh, I think it was October uh, of uh, 2022. So you can go and you can visit now. So if, uh, again, if you are maybe with this video, we'll get to someone who is in London or will travel to London. So I think it's a must-see place, the same as Walter uh, Museum Collection. And also additionally, now this uh, Leighton Museum House is connected uh, with um, Lindley Sunburn Museum. So it is also another uh, art residence. Uh, uh, and it is both of these uh, houses are under this one, uh, one like company or how to call it, one committee. Uh, so you can, yeah, so as far as I saw on the side, you can actually buy the ticket on like both of these museums at once and it will save you a little bit of money. So this is everything that I have for today. Uh, this is very beautiful. I hope also again, I hope one day to go, go there and to see it on my own eyes because this will... will uh, everything not just this Arab hall or some parts of, like for everything for me looks amazing I really like houses like that and uh, to be honest it will be 
delighted to live in a house like that um, but uh, yeah so again check out the description below so for another video and for the um, link to the site uh, so if you're interested to do more researches on that and well i hope you find out something new for yourself which is the most important for me uh, and uh, wish you all the best stay healthy uh inspire it whatever well again wish you all the best and hope to see you in the next videos bye bye